There we go. All right. I would like to thank the organizers very much for uh, uh, giving me an opportunity to speak about this topic, also for the flexibility um, to deal with the needing to change times. I would like to thank uh, uh, Tobias to, uh, for switching with me uh, yesterday. Um, yeah, so the idea of this talk is I'm hoping not to get too technical. I'm hoping it's something that's not going to be too rough to follow. And really, the point of it is um, my collaborators and I are trying to do something that seems rather new. Uh, I think a lot of great things can come out of it. And honestly, the more minds that are working on it, the better. There's lots of open problems. There's also the need to talk to people in a lot of other fields to find applications or results that might be relevant. So if you're interested in anything during this talk where I'll be uh, giving some open, open problems, or if you know people who are interested in some of the connections I'm talking about, I uh, any of that would be great. Um, so the part, uh, the the results that I'll be presenting as part of this, uh, those have been done in collaboration with Dmitry Bilik, uh, Demir Ferizovic, uh, Alexei Lazirin, Josiah Park, who uh, unfortunately wasn't able to make it in person uh, for the workshop, and then uh, Alex Bozuk, who also unfortunately was not able to make it in person, but we have seen um, some. Um, yeah, so. The nice thing about me speaking now is I can kind of skip over a little bit of background because at this point you've seen a lot about energy. Um, so if anybody wants to, I can go over the definition again, but you know, I, hopefully you're all familiar with discrete energy, continuous energy. The slide is about it being on the sphere, but of course we can do it in all other kinds of settings. Um, and common questions to ask, at least in the, the area that I work in is about minimization. What are the minimum energies that you can achieve? What uh, measures or point configurations produce that? Um, and of course, right, we've also seen examples of when you can add in temperature. Maybe you, maybe someone would want to work with dynamics. Lots of different opportunities. Um, we've seen things more in context with Reese energy, so I think it maybe is worth uh, talking a little bit about some things that maybe haven't been as mentioned that can come out of working with energy. So certainly. You can model a lot of natural phenomena. So interactions of electrons, that's just the Coulomb energy. We've seen plenty of that. Uh, interaction between atoms, that's things like the Leonard Jones potential. We've seen plenty of that. Um, it can, but it can also be used to model more biological things like the um, like swarm behavior. Um, it's a bit of what uh, Alex was saying, where sometimes the uh, repulsive attractive things and the clumping it can lead to is um, maybe actually a good way to describe social behavior and uh, between humans or between animals. And there's actually been a fair bit of work showing that some of this modeling has been pretty useful for dynamic purposes. Um, same thing for cellular interactions. Um, outside of that, um, uh, knowing things about various different types of energies with different types of kernels can give you information on certain types of discrepancies or Wasserstein distances. Um, these are, if you're unfamiliar with, the details aren't important so much as they're a measure of how uniformly distributed point sets are on whatever uh, whatever space you're working in. Um, if you have things that, if you have point sets that are uniformly distributed, then potentially that's useful for discretizing manifolds, which is um, discretizing things is always one of my uh, go-tos for when people ask, what's the use of what I research? It's, well, you can take things that are continuous and break them up into tiny pieces and then work on the tiny pieces and computers like that. Um, uh, outside of Reese energies and other kinds of singular kernels, um, my background actually is more of working with continuous kernels. And so some of the things that I've experienced in the last several years are working with um, the frame energy. So just having a kernel that is the inner product squared and the minimization of this energy actually uh, produces what are called tight frames, which are very useful in signal processing. Um, and if you are interested in that, I'm happy to talk in further detail about that. The generalization of these, the P-frame energies, um, these actually, the minimization of these actually relate to uh, problems in convex geometry and quantum information theory, and it just would take a while to explain. So I'm just going to say the buzzwords, and if you're interested, I am happy to discuss more. Um, and perhaps the lead into everything else I'm going to discuss is another thing you can do with them is try to solve interesting geometric problems, possibly ones that have been conjectured. 
decades ago, and maybe you can find a fun new way to deal with that. Um, the all right, so the 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 big star of energy optimization are the Reese kernels, right? These are the ones that everyone wants to go to first, or maybe not everyone, but seemingly that's where the theory went first. So, right, we've seen plenty of this. I don't need to go into too much detail. Um, but you know, a couple of highlights is of course that you know this is a generalization of the Thompson problem, which is over a century old, which is about uh, the best way to distribute electrons on some metal sphere. Um, if you have the Reese negative one energy, so basically just the Euclidean distance, and you can take sums of those, that relates to um, a certain type of discrepancy, the L2 spherical cap discrepancy through something that is known as the Stolarski invariance principle. Again, it's a fantastic result. It's really interesting. And I and like if you're if you're interested in finding out more, I'm happy to talk more about it. Uh, we've heard about Snell's problem, you know, about the logarithmic energy. Um, and we've also heard a bit about how when we take S going to infinity, that this relates to the patent problem. So there's a lot of really great things that are coming out of these Reese kernels. Um, there are results that are there, uh, you know, there's been study, there's been study for a while about how we can minimize the energies. Um, and um, and so there are results saying that for the for the continuous problem, finding a probability me probability measure to minimize, um, if your exponent is between negative two and the dimension of your sphere, um, then the uniform measure on the sphere is the minimizer. If you hit the case where s is equal to negative two, so arguably you could think about you could think of this as maximizing the sum or integral of just the Euclidean distance squared, um, which you can rewrite as just right, two minus two times the inner product between two points. Um, if you want to minimize the negative of this, um, then any measure with center of mass at the origin is a minimizer. So you, get, you go from having a unique one to just having a whole big class of uh, minimizers. And then once you go beyond that, once you go to, once you go to, uh, uh, for S being less than negative two, um, then the energy is uniquely minimized by any measure that can be written as a uniform distribution on a pair of antipodal points. Um, a relatively quick way to see that is that if you are comparing um, the Euclidean distance of two points on the sphere, squared over two to uh, uh, the Euclidean distance raised to some higher power. Uh, what would it, what would I want to do? I would think I would want to do, ah, this should be two squared, two to the P. Um, then it turns out that for any choices of X and Y, uh, this is always greater than or equal to right, raising to a higher power of P for any P uh greater than or equal to two one of the ways of maximizing this kernel or minimizing if you put a negative in front of this is again anything with center of mass of the, at the origin so that's just a pair of antipodal points with equal weights at each of them and so the distances you can get are zero and one and one being the sorry zero and two but that means that this value right here is one and that's also the biggest thing that can happen here. These two are only equal if X and Y are the same points or, an, or if they are antipodal points. And because of that, because you get a pair of antipodal points as a maximizer here, you get it as a maximizer here. So that's a bit of the idea of where that is coming from. It's just a simple comparison of right, two graphs. And so in the discrete setting, there are also a variety of results that kind of accumulate together to say that if S is greater than negative two, then in the discrete setting, we have that minimizers of the uh, Reese energies are uniformly distributed on the sphere. Um, and so making them very useful kernels to work with, it's wonderful to get things that are uniformly distributed. Uh, one other bit of results to talk about for Reese energies before we get to where we're really going for this talk um, is the result that was mentioned, the results that were mentioned uh, in Doug and Ed's talks about the results of Khan and Kumar, basically saying that sharp endpoint configurations, um, when they exist, are minimizers of the 
um, of the recent energies, the discrete recent energies uh, for the, that number of points for S greater than negative two. So, and examples of these, they're very rare, but examples are um, the vertices of regular polygons, cross polytopes, the icosahedron, uh, I think what minimum elements of the E8 lattice or the Leach lattice. Um, and then finally, simplices. And this is really where we're going to uh, start basing uh, the ideas we're going to go from here about. So um, when you have any number of points between two and the dimension of the sphere plus two, um, then the only n point minimizers of the uh, Reese energies uh, for S greater than negative two, this is always going to be our cutoff, um, are the vertices of a regular n minus one simplex with center at the origin. Um, so, right, so a simple enough thing to do if you're looking at the circle and you're putting down three points and you want to take right, the, sum of dis the sum of distances raised to some kind of power, um, then the way to uh, raise to some kind of negative power, let's say, then the way to minimize that is to just right, make it a regular triangle. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's a somewhat interesting geometric question uh, that uh, the somewhat interesting geometric result. And this is a bit of where we're going to go into um, something a bit more multivariate, uh, something a bit higher dimensional. So let's say that you have something between two, you have some M between two and the dimension of the sphere plus two. Um, which d plus one simplicity, so d plus, so whenever I say a something simplex, that is the dimension of the simplex I'm talking about. So on the sphere S2, you put down d plus two vertices, you get, you take their convex hole, you get a simplex that's of dimension d plus one, which is the dimension of the ambient space. Um, which d plus one simplices maximize the sum of volumes of the m minus one dimensional faces? So a bit of an example is, so here on the circle, let's say I have three points, I make a triangle out of it. The first question that you can say is that if M is uh, D plus two, so this is S1, so just you know three points, we're talking about the, just the area of the triangle, which triangle maximizes that area. Alternatively, if I take M being two, well, then we're just back to the sum of distances between points, which is what was answered by Conan Kumar's result. Though there are also earlier results that address this specific question, um, right? We can go up into higher dimensions and ask such things. So here in three dimensions, if I'm looking at the tetrahedron, then I can ask about what maximizes the volume of the tetrahedron, what maximizes the surface area of the tetrahedron, and what maximizes the sum of lengths of edges of the tetrahedron. And actually there are results from the 1900s for each of those questions. Um, for the full dimensional, uh, for the question in full dimension, so D plus two, um, it's only regular simplices. If you go down one, in one dimension, so uh, again, looking at the tetrahedron, we're talking about all the triangular faces. It's again, the regular simplices. And what? The Always the same answer, yes. Um, and as far as I'm aware, these are the only examples that are known. It's basically you either are looking at the case where you have two inputs, or sorry, where you're looking at um, the length of the distances, you're looking at the, the co-dimensional one surfaces, or you're looking at the total volume. Um, I'm not aware of results for anything in between those. So here, this is my attempt to draw a four-dimensional object on a two-dimensional plane as a three-dimensional being. Um, so the point would be that, so for this, if I tried to do the same question for the triangular faces, I don't think that there's a previous, I don't know of a previous geometric answer for that. Luckily, these can all be considered as energies just with kernels with more inputs as opposed to two. How am I doing on time so far? You did like 15 minutes? I've done 15 minutes so far? I think no. Is there any benefit that anybody check? I think, yes, I, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. So I have uh, I have 10 minutes then. Oh, okay. Well, then there's some stuff I might move a little bit faster through then. But anyways, until eight, so you don't have to Yeah, don't rush. Go on. All right, all right, all right. If, if, all, of, if all of you are okay with giving me time, I, I, I promise there's good, pay, there's good payoff here. A lot of you are students. If you want open problems, they're coming. We are the top class. Yes. Okay. 
So basically, this is the first slide that I had where it was defining energy. Just now we have kernels with more inputs. So you know, we for discrete energy, before we had kernels with just two inputs, and we, you know, we took the two inputs had to be distinct. Now we have kernels of M inputs, and all of the inputs have to be distinct, but you take all possible combinations for that. And then the continuous energy, you just take integrals. It's exactly what you think it would be. Um, and basically, the whole idea here is you can start asking all of the same questions about these type of energies that you did for the two input case. They're just going to be much harder to answer. But asking the questions is easy, and trying to answer them can be fun. Um, and special cases, maybe. And I, I don't know. I mean, right when people started off with the theory of when people started off with potential theory, I imagine things seemed hard then. They've had well over a hundred years to work on it, and they've gotten a lot of results. As far as I'm aware, Nobody's really worked on developing theory for these types of questions. There's a lot for two input kernels, but very little to none for when you start having kernels of more inputs, at least treated in this kind of sense. Um, and there are reasons to develop such theory. And what my collaborators, collaborators and I want to do, and what I really want to push for is to see what can be done for such types of questions. And you'll see more of why as I go along. But asking about the simplicities. So I asked you a geometric question. Let me rephrase this as a energy optimization question and generalize it a little bit. So we have a function a sub m with m inputs, where basically that is the m minus one dimensional volume of an m minus one dimensional simplex with vertices x1 through xm. Um, and you can, in the same way that Ries kernels are just the Euclidean distance raised to some power, possibly times negative one, you can do the exact same thing. You can start taking powers of the volumes of the simplices and have start asking questions about minimizing uh, these. And of course, when M is equal to two, these are exactly the Ries kernels. And this is why I can get away with calling them generalized Ries kernels. Turns out there's about eight different things you could do in this case and get away with calling them generalized Ries kernels. But I think this is one of the nicer ones. Um, and so the question I, that I asked about, you know, taking the sum of the faces, the, the, the volumes of the faces, this is just a question of minimizing the energy for uh, S equals negative one over d plus two point sets. So just put d plus two points on the sphere and try to do this energy optimization problem. And, and turns out that for each of these, for all the powers s greater than negative two, the only minimizers of these energies on the sphere are the, again, the vertices of the regular simplex. So exactly the kind of generalization for the Reese result that you know, one would hope to have. And, um, and yeah, this is what I'm going to try to do a little bit of a skim of a proof for. Um, the, I've learned there was recently a result that covered some of these cases, but we managed to get something that was a little bit more general. Um, but what was interesting is that these two, uh, Hohner and Ledford, they came from this problem from an entirely convex geometry standpoint and got this result in an entirely different way. So it was interesting to meet one of them and discuss about this. And that was how I learned people are actually really interested in such results. Yes. Because you mentioned this generalized risk kernels, mm -hmm. uh, will there be generalized Gaussian also? So this is somewhere where no work has been done. So if you're someone who's a big fan of the things you heard about Gaussian kernels earlier this week and think, hey, that'd be really cool to see what can be done if we had more inputs and see if we could develop a theory of completely monotonic functions and minimizers for those. That's open. I highly encourage it. As I said, the whole point of this talk is I want to convince some of the, I would love to convince some of you that this is an area worth working in and maybe motivate some, uh, some attempts at some open problems. Um, so talking really quickly about the result that I just said, I'm going to go through some details of the proof, but not in too much detail. Um, in the case, S is equal to negative two. So you remember that for the Reese kernels, that's exactly where you go from uniform measure as a minimizer to lots of things are minimizers. Um, the re reason why is because you have this nice polynomial going on and there's lots of nice things happening because of that. 
The same thing happens with these uh, volumes of simplices. When you take the power S equals negative two, you get something that's polynomial and you get a very nice decomposition into two pieces. We're gonna call G here a correction term. And then what these are, what these terms are, are the, the M minus one, if you have M inputs, these are the M minus one dimensional volumes of a simplex with vertices uh, at the origin and the points y sub one through y sub n minus one. So the difference here is you could say, I want the area of the triangle, or what you could look at is, if this is the origin, you could look at each one of these sub triangles separately. Um, now, a neat thing to notice is of course, that if your m is two, in which case we're back to the Reese energy, then you're just talking about the distance from the origin to each of your vertices. So that's just one. So not as, uh, not as exciting, but it actually does a good job of reproducing this, this function. Um, so, um, right, so we get this kind of decomposition. And luckily, there has been a recent theory, uh, result by Kael and Kazaza saying that um, if we have the squared of these kinds of volumes, um, and we're looking in the continuous sense, so um, looking at probability measures, then these then taking the energy of these volumes squared is maximized by isotropic measures. So these are measures that have um, that have second moment matrices uh, that act as one over d plus one times the identity, or the equivalent is that they minimize the frame energy, uh, which I talked about before. Basically, they're like two designs if you don't care about them working on linear polynomials, only polynomials with quadratic or constant terms. That's what these isotropic measures are like. For the correction term, uh, that's actually built out of something much more complicated. And because of time limits, I'm actually gonna somewhat skip over this, but I will say that this is a very interesting kernel that comes out of, uh, that comes as a modification of things used in what's called semi-definite programming. And the important thing about this kernel is it is not symmetric. It is symmetric in the last n minus two variables, so three through m, and that comes from the determinant of the gram matrix of those matrices. And then over here, we have an inner product that depends upon x1 and x2, and is symmetric in that regard. And that is the extent to which I will talk about those. I'm happy to go into more detail later if you have questions. We get that correction term in the last slide, by basically taking the sum over all permutations of the inputs, giving us a symmetric uh, polynomial. So a symmetric kernel, which was something that we would need to have that kind of correction term. Um, now, what comes out of that is that we can then show that the continuous energy of these uh, of these Reese, these multivariate Reese kernels for s equals negative two are minimized exactly by isotropic measures with centers of mass at the origin. In other words, things that behave like two designs. So they act exactly like the Euclidean, they, uh, they act exactly like integrating with respect to the uniform measure on the sphere for polynomials of degree one or two. Um, and so examples of minimizers are then, of course, the uniform measure. Or the or a uniform measure over the vertices of the regular d plus one simplex. Um, now that said, the minimizers for s greater than negative two are unknown. That's something that's open. We think that it is the uniform measure, but that's entire because that's what happens with the two input Reese energies. But it's entirely open, and would love to see, you know see ideas that would be useful uh, towards uh, showing that. Um, as a corollary of this result for S less than negative two, the minimizers of the, of the uh, Reese S energies are exactly the uniform measures on the vertices of the regular D plus one simplex. So basically because, so that's exactly when you have D plus two inputs. So you're taking the D plus one dimensional volume. This kind of comes from the exact same idea as what happened with the Reese energies. You basically, when you're taking the sum, you're either getting zero or you're getting the biggest volume possible. And so as you send S going to negative infinity, it's like everything here just goes to zero except for at that maximum value. And so it's just a nice corollary that follows from that. But if we take fewer inputs, 
we don't actually know what ha what happens. We have some ideas of what might happen, um, but we've not yet been able to show that. And it would be interesting to do that because going from say here on S two, you're looking at the you're looking at the tetrahedron being best for when you have S equals negative two. If say you're taking the area of triangles. As S goes to negative infinity, what we would actually expect is eventually you go to a uniform distribution on the vertices of a regular triangle instead. So somehow, instead of having the immediate shift we saw with the Reese energies, where you go from lots of different options to just uh, two, to just two antipodal points, there potentially would be some kind of morphing from something that looks like this to something that looks like uh, um, uh, just a triangle from the tetrahedron. And part of the reason why is because the vertices of a triangle are not a uh, are not a two design in, on S two, so that couldn't possibly be a minimizer for S equals negative two. So the same kind of results don't work. So that would actually be an interesting thing to pursue. Um, how am I? I'm probably already. I'm already over. Okay. So the so then I'm not going to go into detail for the proof here. The, for the last part, basically what ends up happening is that in the same way that for Reese, uh, basically you go from having S being negative two to saying, hey, I'm going to now take powers of this that give me a decreasing strictly convex function. And it turns out that convexity and knowing what the minimum of the, of the S equals negative two energy are, give you a lower bound where you get equality exactly when all the summons are equal and where you have that your point set is a spherical two design. That is exactly the regular simplex. Um, so that's kind of the idea of the result. And now I'd, I'd like to take a little bit more time just to say connections and what's open. So you saw some of what's open, figuring out things for these Reese energies are certainly open. And also for the other kernel, where you instead you're taking the, the uh, origin as one of the simplices and looking at, sorry, as one of the vertices and looking at simplices like that, Knowing what happens with powers of those is also open, but there are also connections to um, there are connections to various of the natural various parts of the natural sciences. So there are results where basically to study and model carbon nanostructures, um, it turns out that just having two particle interactions isn't necessarily the best way to model. And on top of that, you want something that accounts for the bond angle between the different atoms, and so. Um, there is a paper by Menini and Stefanelli that basically uses a kernel that looks just that looks just like this and has exactly a um, has three inputs. There are apparently other uh, phenomenon in various parts of physics that may also be me uh, modeled better by many body interactions instead of two body interactions. Um, and this is something that my collaborators and I are one trying to learn about and two also trying to think of as a way to come up with results that will be useful to these physicists. <laughs> Who are trying to do or material scientists who are doing such things. Um, examples of where multivariate kernels can appear in maths because we're in uh, the UK. So that's, that's I believe, what you say. Um, there's the total Menger curvature, which is something that comes out of geometric, uh, sorry, geometric measure theory, um, something that seems rather important. Uh, my collaborators and I have found a connection between this simple kernel, which is just the product of inner products. And a question, a question posed by Eridos and proven by Rosenfield, what is the maximum size of almost orthogonal sets? So these are sets where if you take any triple, there are at least two, there are at least two elements that are orthogonal to each other. Um, that's known to, to be that the biggest it could be is two times the dimension. And we were able to actually show a slightly more general result that recovers that from a more energy optimization uh, approach. Apparently, also these discrete energies that I was talking about for these multivariate kernels are a way of interpreting what are called U statistics, um, which are ways of making minimum vari minimum, minimum var variance unbiased estimators for various types of parameters. This is also somewhere where if you know a statistician that is interested in U statistics, I would love to know what the results are and what might be relevant to these kinds of questions. The final bit of motivation comes from the fact that there's been a lot of work with what's called semi-definite programming with multivariate kernels, um, which produce what are called endpoint bounds. So uh, with linear programming, where you have two inputs, they're called two input bounds. You have M inputs, they're called M, M input bounds. And there has been work with such kernels 
that, and that has resulted in better bounds on the number of equiangular lines for certain angles or on the kissing numbers in various dimensions. And so if one, if we were able to develop theory where we could really understand how these multivariate kernels work, come up with good ideas for them, we could potentially continue to improve both computationally and theoretically what can be done to achieve these endpoint bounds and then improve a number of things that come from linear programming, uh, bounds on, on, pa on um, packings, on equiangular lines, on kissing numbers, on coverings, uh, on spherical design. And so some important questions to answer, what are good ways to decompose kernels? We saw things with Gegenbauer polynomials before. Um, I showed you an attempt at, at decomposing a simple quadratic polynomial and it got rather complicated. These semi-definite programming methods, they lead to very complicated decompositions. Um, what can you determine about a kernel without decomposing it into pieces? Do we see it? We saw plenty of theory from Doug and Ed about what could be done just from looking at a kernel and not worrying about breaking it into Gegenbauer polynomials. It's what can we reproduce? And we've made some progress in doing that, but it, it gets rather complicated and there's still plenty to do. And I can list off all the different things that maybe are directions that would be interesting to go in. Um, can we do just normal linear programming for these M input kernels? Because semi-definite programming is something different that's much more complicated and much harder to work with. And finally, a seemingly very simple question, what are necessary and sufficient conditions for the uniform measure to be a minimizer of the energy? We don't have that. We don't have that for anything that's really significant or, or functions of great interest. And that would be a fascinating thing to do and find out about. And if you could do that, you could probably have an easier time answering each of these other questions. Um, yeah. So lots of open problems. I hope this was interesting to you. If you are interested, I have a list of things that you could possibly be working on. And I could just tell you them until you find something that you're interested in. And if you know someone who works in physics or in statistics or geometry that would be interested in this kind of stuff or knows things that would be useful for this, I would love to be talking to them, especially someone if they work in youth statistics. But Thank you very much for your time and listening. I appreciate it. I know it's been a long week. I know it's been a long day. Thank you. Well, what if we have given you know, more questions? Do, do you, anybody? We have a Go for it. Uh, well, I know that we all want to get to eat and eat, so I'll be quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, I'll be quick. Um, one, uh, what would happen if you can turn it now uh, the same energy function with a potential. So now what were the regions of, of the sphere of the WF favor or this favor? And then the other one is what's known about stability with respect to uh, perturbations of the configuration. So if I perturb the the, the, the interaction a little bit, mm -hmm. is the, the optimal configuration is perturbed by a little bit. So to answer your first question, um uh, so you're talking about having a, external fields for, for your first question, right? So basically in the same way that for the two input kernels, you can kind of, hang on, let me, let me write on the board. Um, in the same way, so with two input kernels, if you are looking at something like this, I mean, arguably you can just say that this is some other two input kernel that it just depends on X and Y. Right, I haven't, in that moment, I haven't said that anything specifically depends upon the interaction between X and Y. And so there is some theory that would cover such cases, but in general, no, nothing is known. There's, no been, there's not been any specific covering of anything about an external field being applied. Um, this is something that I'm not aware of anyone, as I said, really working on my collaborators. And I just started trying to do this in the last few years. Again, seeing that people were, trying to do these things with k-point bounds and thinking, hey, if we had good potential theory for this, maybe that could improve it. And then we came across a lot of other interesting things. For your second question, as far as I'm aware, again, because we're the only ones I'm aware of working on this at all, nobody's looked at anything with perturbations. So yeah, that's wide open. Both of them. Okay. Well then. Uh, collaboration can happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said. Uh, 
and but anyway uh, let's thank you and let's keep talking while we are going to the dinner mm -hmm. okay